Father, this morning as we seek to honor our graduates and Lord, open up your word once again. Father, I just pray once again that, Lord, you would make me small and that, Lord, that the words and thoughts that I share from your word, Lord, would be just that and that, Lord, the, the, your Holy Spirit would take these words and use them, Lord, for the purpose for which you see fit, and, and Lord, to be a challenge and an encouragement to us all. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What's in the name? That's a line from a famous play by Shakespeare. And without going into all of Juliet's musings about the philosophical meaning of language and names, I would like to talk to you for a few minutes this morning about your name and what your name means. People's names can be pretty interesting, and the meaning behind their names can be even more interesting. And a few weeks ago, as we've been in the book of Isaiah, we were looking at a, a child that, that Isaiah had whose name was Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Now, if you ever wonder, why would anybody name their child something like that? I mean, uh, Stephen, my son-in-law, was joking and saying that before Emmett was born, they were talking about naming him Maharshala Hashbaz. He told me that after the service. But um, but the, the fact is, is the reason why he got that name was that's the name that God told Isaiah to give him. Because Isaiah was a prophet. And as a prophet, that meant that God spoke to him directly with a message that he was then supposed to communicate to the people of Judah. And he said, I want you to, you're going to have a child, and I want you to name him Mahar Shalal Hashbaz. Anybody remember what that means? Oh, it's right there on the screen, so you don't have to remember. Quick to plunder, swift to the spoil. And the idea behind that was that God was even going to use Isaiah's child's name as a message for the people of Judah to remind them what he had foretold, that the nation of Assyria was going to come and carry away all the wealth from the region. And Isaiah had another son, and his name was Shear Jashub. And Shear Jashub means a remnant shall remain. And in fact, Isaiah's own name means salvation of the Lord. And in Isaiah chapter 8 in verse 18, Isaiah was, was saying, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents to Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. And we often talk about signs when you know, when springtime comes and we see little robins hopping around, that's, that's a sign that spring is just around the corner. And I remember we would always get really excited when I was a little kid. Hey, we saw a robin. We saw a robin. Is this the first robin? And there was a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon where he thought he was going to get a prize for being the first one to see a robin. But um, or when you see the flowers bloom, that's a sign that spring is on the way. But what, what kind of a sign is it when the sky gets really dark and black and the wind starts blowing? That, that's also a sign, isn't it? And what kind of sign is that? What does that mean? It's going to storm. And that kind of sign is more like a portent. A portent has the idea of something that is more of a warning. And so Isaiah said, the children the Lord has given me, I and the children, the message I'm preaching, even the names of my sons are signs and portents for the people of Israel. Their names meant something. And the thing about languages, though, is that they are constantly evolving and changing. If a language is being spoken actively by people, it's always in a state of change. And so, I doubt very much this morning when you hear the name Isaiah that the first thing you think of is, oh, salvation is from the Lord. Now you just think, it's a name. Isaiah is a name. We have some missionaries, Fred and Cindy Stromberg. They have a son named Isaiah. I was in Food Lion a few weeks ago, and I ran into a young man and talked to him whose, whose name was also Isaiah. We just think about it as a name. But the fact is, is that all of our names actually at one time had a meaning. And I'm just curious, how many of you have ever taken the time to look up the, 
the, the linguistic meaning of your own name. How many of you have done that? Yeah, yeah quite a few. Um, my name is Douglas, and Doug for short. And Douglas is actually a Scottish name that means dark stream or black river. And that, that, that's, the, that's the meaning behind my name. Um, my wife's name is Dorcas. Anybody know what Dorcas means? I know. Tabitha knows. Yes. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Both Dorcas and Tabitha mean gazelle. Now, Dorcas is, the, is a Greek name. Tabitha is the Hebrew version of that. And so, and, uh, and, and we're honoring our graduates today, and so I looked up their names. Um, Isabella means devoted to God, or God is my oath. Abigail, my father's joy. Boy, isn't that a sweet name? Yeah. My father's joy. Uh, the name Dylan means son of the sea, or born from the ocean. Uh, Jaden means thankful, or God will judge. Um, Iva means uh, God is gracious, and the name Mary, as in Mary Jo, that can mean some different things, but it comes from the Hebrew word Mara, which is bitter, and so Mary it can mean bitterness, or it can mean a drop of the sea. And so it's just really interesting to look up some of the word origins behind our names. But when you hear those names, I doubt very much if you think about those original meanings. For example, when you say the name uh, Douglas, if I'm the only Douglas you know, I doubt very much that you think of a dark stream, unless you think about me standing in a dark stream fishing for trout, because that's what I like to do, and that's where the trout usually like to hide. But I doubt when you hear Dorcas or Tabitha, you probably don't think about this cute little animal skipping around on the plains of Africa. <laughs> Kristen says, I will now. Oh, by the way, do you know what the name Kristen means? Follower of Christ. I mean, how awesome is that? That's really cool. Uh, I, I originally planned to share this the week that the Olympians got their awards, and so I had all your names looked up. But anyway, when you hear those names, I doubt very much that you think about those original meetings, but what you think about is when you hear those names, the faces of those people come into your mind, and what you think about is what kind of a person they really are. You'll think about things that you've heard them say. You'll think about things that they're known for. You'll think about things that they do. And, and when, you see, when you hear their name and you see their faces in your mind, you will think about the kind of people that they are. And the Bible says in the book of Proverbs that a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. And here Solomon is not talking about the linguistic origin of a person's name or whether this person's name is cool sounding or not. What he's talking about is a person's reputation and the value of a good name. And the kind of person that you are is what people are going to think about when they hear your name. In fact, the Bible says in another verse in Proverbs that even a child is known by his deeds, whether what he does is pure or right. And this is not talking about real estate. This is talking about the things that you do. Your deeds are the things that you do. And even a child, when you mention that child's name, they're going to be thinking, oh, what a sweet little kid. Yeah, I have him in junior church. He or, oh, man, that's the kid that crawls right up the chalkboard. And, and I, I was that kid, believe me. I mean, I, I won't even begin to tell you some of the stuff I used to do in church when I was little. It was awful. But um, even a child is known by your deeds. And when people hear your name, they're automatically going to think about the kind of person you are. They're going to think about things they've heard you say. They're going to think about things they've watched you do. They're going to think about things they've heard about you from other people. And in short, when a people who, who know you hear your name, they're going to think about the kind of person that you are. 
And so the words that you say and the things that you do and the way that you treat people is pretty important, isn't it? Because that's what people are going to think about when they hear your name. That's why the writer of Proverbs says a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches and favor is better than silver or gold. And what he meant by that is that your reputation is worth far more than any amount of money you might make. I mean, just think about it. How much money did Bernie Madoff have? A lot of money. Does he have a good name? Charles Ponzi had a lot of money. But what do you think about when you hear the name Ponzi? Ponzi scheme. I mean, his name is forever associated with swindling people. And when you think about the name Quisling, uh, maybe you don't even know who Quisling was, but anybody know who Quisling was? He was a traitor who sold out his country, and so when his name is associated with treason. When you hear the name Harvey Weinstein, he has a lot of money, but he doesn't have a good name. And your reputation is so much more important than any amount of money you might make. And even just on a personal level, a practical level, there is nothing worth the price of your reputation. Don't ever sacrifice it for any reason. But there's something here that is even more important. Something that it, that it, something more important that is at stake here. Because even beyond our own personal reasons for wanting to have a good name and wanting to have a good reputation, is because we were not created just so that we could make a good name for ourselves. But we were created and placed on this earth so that we could be a credit to the God who created us. We were created and placed here on this earth so we could be a reflection of our creator and bring glory to his name. That's the biblical language that's used. We're put here so that we could bring glory to God's name so that when people would see us, they would look at us and say, man, Isn't God awesome? Look at that person that he's made. Look at how, and and, and everything about us is supposed to bring glory and honor and praise to God. In fact, in Isaiah 43, verses 6 and 7, the Lord says this, I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name who I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Every one of us was created to bring glory and praise to God. It's like when you see some beautiful piece of craftsmanship that that somebody has done. I remember being at someone's house and was just amazed at the woodworking job they had done on these tables. And you just look at that and think, Wow, what a master. What an amazing thing this man was able to put together, you know, with his hands and and this thing that he created. And that's why God created us. So that we would bring glory and praise to his name as our creator. So that brings us to a question. How do you think you're doing with that? How are we doing with that? When people speak your name, does it cause people to give glory and praise to God? Or does your name bring other things to people's minds? And do you know what the the requirement is for living up to the name of the God who created us? It's a pretty tall requirement, don't you think? And somebody asked Jesus that question one day. And they asked him by saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, what does God want from me? 
What does he require from me so that I'll be okay with him and so that he'll receive me? Jesus actually turned the question around on him. And he asked him, well, what does the word of God say? What does it say in God's law? And the man answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. To which Jesus responded, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. And the man completely missed the point. Because the first thing that he said was, and who's my neighbor? I mean, just think about what this guy's frame of mind was. Okay, Lord, I got that first one down. Who's my neighbor? That's what he was saying. He thought, I'm okay with this. Guys, you just graduated, so uh, let, 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 let me see if you all are smarter than this man was, okay? Let me give you a math problem, sort of. How many days have you been here on the earth? I know you probably can't pull that information out of the, off the top of your head, but just think, how many days? Just start doing the math in your mind. And as you think about all the days that you have been here on the earth, how many of those days would you say that you have loved the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength? Not even messing with that part of loving other people as much as you love yourself. Well, I will have to tell you that during the roughly 21,678 days, give or take, whatever leap year would be involved in there, I don't know. I cannot claim to have done that for one single day. And neither can any one of you. We all fail. We all fall miserably short of that. And in fact, God just comes right out and tells us this in Romans 3.23 where he tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We were created to bring glory to God, but we've all sinned. And so we all fall short of that. In fact, he says there is none righteous, not even one. None of us have ever lived up to being worthy of the name of our creator. Not a single one. And the fact is, there is only one man who ever has. One man who lived up to the glory of God and the righteousness of God and the name of God. And his name is Emmanuel. And you know what that name means? God with us. Because God with us, and let me, let me listen, let, listen to what else he says about this name. This name that is above every other name. Isaiah said this, not only was he called Emmanuel, he says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of peace. And my friends, the only way that any man could ever live up to the glory of God's name would be for God himself to become a man and to live among us. And you know, that's exactly what he did in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's not all that he did. Let me tell you something else about his name. The Bible says, in being found in human form, he humbled himself 
by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because Jesus did bring glory to his Father. He did bring glory to him every moment when he was here on this earth. And because he is the wonderful counselor, the everlasting Father, the mighty God, why would he end up hanging on a cross and dying between two criminals? Why would he do that? He did that so that he could take our place. So that he could pay for our sin. So that he could bridge that gap, that eternal gap that separated us from the holy God who created us. And take our sin out of the way. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, the Bible says. And he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And the Bible says everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. We go in on his ticket. We go in on his good name. Our good name has been ruined. And so we get to go in on Jesus' good name. And God forgives us because Jesus paid what we owed him. <coughs> and the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. John said it's through believing in his name that we have life. And there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And it is only through the name of Jesus that we overcome the world, that we overcome this barrier of sin that separates us from God. And when we do, there is a really wonderful, awesome thing that happens. Because not only do we receive forgiveness for our sin, not only does God forgive us and wipe the slate clean, but let me read you what happens with God's name and our name from the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus says that for every person who overcomes, and the one who overcomes is the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, John tells us. Jesus says, I will write on him the name of my God. And the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. Did you ever think about that? When you put your faith in the Lord Jesus, and you lay claim to what he did for you on the cross, you come to him humbly, humble and broken and repentant, believing he died in your place, and you, you, you claim him as your Lord, he writes God's name on you. He writes God's address on you. And he writes on you his own new name. And that means that God accepts you the same way he accepts his son Jesus. It's like you're wearing a spiritual name tag that says property of Almighty God, sealed by God's own Holy Spirit and redeemed by God's only Son, Jesus Christ. That's your name. And you get to live with the name of Jesus and be called by his name. And if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And he gives you and your name whole new meaning. And if we have God's name written on us, and we're called by the name of his son, 
with his spirit living inside of us, now we can bring glory to God in everything that we do. Listen to what Paul said as he prayed for the believers at Thessalonica. He said, to this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, he even says in another place, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And Jesus said in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. When you do good things, And when you say good things, that'll cause people to look at you and and they know that you're called by Jesus' name. They're going to think Jesus is good. When they see you helping other people, when they see you showing compassion, when they see you forgiving others, that's going to cause them to see, well, well, that, 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 that must be what Jesus is like. They're called by Jesus' name and that's how they live. And it just may give you an opportunity to tell them about the one whose name is above every name. And so that they can be called by his name as well. The question is, what do you want people to think of when they hear your name? Let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this wonderful, overwhelming truth that we have read here this morning. Oh, Lord, as we just think about what it is that you have given us. Lord, how that you created us and gave us life. And Lord, we ruined our own good name before you because of our sin. But you send Jesus to live up to your glory so that we can have his good name, his perfect name, written on us. And you receive us just as you receive him. I would like everybody to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I don't do this all the time, but I just want to ask a question. Is is there anybody here? I'm not going to single you out. I'm not going to come looking for you or anything like that. I just want to pray for you. But is there anybody here who would say, Doug, this is news to me. Or maybe you would say, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that my name is messed up and I've never asked Jesus to save me. I've never turned from my sin. I'm I'm still living in it. Doug, would you pray for me? Anybody like that? Would you just slip up your hand right now? Father, I thank you today for, once again, for your word. And Lord, we praise you for your son, Jesus. Dear God, I just pray that all of us would, as Paul said, live in a manner that is worthy of your great name. And so that we will bring glory to you in everything that we do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.